Hello, my name is Emily. I'm an artist in jewelry maker. Welcome back to my channel. Today I thought I'd go back to my roots. Before I was a tattoo artist and even touched clay, I did predominantly portraiture, both pet portraits and family portraits. So I thought I'd give it a go as I've not really done much of this at all for years. So I really wanted to see where my skills were currently and see what I needed to work on to improve this. Everything I did use was linked in the description box, but I start off with some Copic markers. For bases of portraits, I predominantly use Copic markers or similar sort of alcohol markers because I find they're a good way to start off and consolidate the structure of the face without having anything disrupt the layer. So the paper still stays the same. When using these, they don't tend to buckle or tear. I think they're great to have as a base for other materials as pencils and oil pastels and whatnot. And then I start to work in the mid-tone shades, I always start light and then dark because you can always go darker, you can't really take away darkness. So, and I'm rather heavy handed and do get carried away. So I wanted to start off with paler tones just so I know where I need to remain bright and light and then I can add darker tones over the top. I also find with Copic layers, adding a slightly brighter tone to the complexion as well gives a, a really nice warmth to the undertone. Likewise, if you have more of a cooler undertone that you're working with, it's great to add things like violet and blue because it can give that coolness that you can use as an underlayer and then layer the more flesh tones over the top and it doesn't look quite so harsh. Another reason why I use Copic markers is that when you layer different colours over the top of each other, they do sort of merge together. It takes a bit of effort to do that, but it does work quite well because then when you blend pencils over the top, it's less of a harsh define. I think it works quite well to give a bit more of a seamless blend as skin would normally do. But then you also have the layers where there is a bit more contrast within those depths. It's also great to warm up with this sort of layer because it's going to be covered by pencils and other materials afterwards so if there are any mistakes or things that you want to rectify you can see them before you actually permanently make them that way while this won't be seen completely as it is now i do find it's quite an integral part of the portrait process because you can see the likeness start to come through but then any areas that you know can work on to make that likeness more apparent basically the more you work on with this layer the less work you have to do on the other areas you kind of know what you're doing a little bit more that being said, portraits are very much trial and error. If something doesn't work, there are absolutely ways around it. You just have to learn those techniques through experience. I think getting things wrong are equally as important as getting things right, because you know what to do in a situation when things do go wrong, and also you know what to avoid in the future portraits. I would always advise going mid-tone with your base layers, just because if it's darker and there's more depth and dimension, it's less likely to be as easy to rectify. It just becomes a little bit more permanent and if it isn't in the right place or you struggle to see the lightness, it will just take a lot longer to get to a point where you're happy with it. As much as the base isn't that visible, it is a very integral part of the portrait process. Normally the first step I do after I've done the base is work in any definite dark areas so I know that that is the darkest I can go and everywhere else is mid-tone or can be worked in but that won't be as dark as these layers I'm putting in now. If I've got my really lights and really darks, it's very much an easier process to know where to go. Obviously more can be added in between the process, but I do find having the darker layers first, it gives the piece a more definite direction of where to go from there. Once we have our darkest and lightest areas, I then work in with the brightest areas. The kind of area where on Instagram you would add the saturation, the areas that would go brighter are the areas that I would do next because these are the more undertone based areas and you can layer over the top of those. They always stay that bright. In amongst these brighter layers, I do then go in with some more mid-tone, cooler areas because then it gives a bit more contrast and sometimes makes the brightness look brighter without actually adding more pigment. And it can also help hone in on the construction of the face, get the structure sorted before you have to go into the more fiddly, preciser areas. Once the saturated areas are finished, I then go in with a lighter mid-tone shade because then I can start to blend all these colours together, get a bit more of a gradient effect so it isn't quite so stark in the contrast. And one of my favourite pencils that does this so well are the Derwent Drawing Pencils. Now, this is the one that I'm using and it's in Light Sienna. Very warm, so if you were doing a cooler complexion, this one might just be a little bit too warm. But for this painting of Pedro Pascal, it worked perfectly because the picture that I was working from had a very, very warm salmon pink sort of coral hue to it and it is pretty much a very long process of layering and layering and layering and once you get to a certain point where you're happy with the basic structure it's then time to define 
I normally do this by adding a little bit more saturation but in a slightly darker tone so for example in this piece there's a lot of warm pink almost like a yellow toned pink so I wanted to have that as part of the spectrum within this piece so I thought going a few shades darker and this was Pompeian Red in the Faber-Castell Polychromo line and this worked really well to add that structure and depth but without sacrificing the hue or saturation. What's great about this is as well as it making the colour more apparent, it also doesn't change the structure of the face that much. It predominantly just works as a mid-tone. And by this, I mean if I was to change this picture into black and white, you wouldn't really see much difference in the depth using this colour. It would predominantly just work on the saturation, which in a grayscale painting, you wouldn't really see much difference. So that's what's great about this, is that it develops structure, but only for a colour piece. When you're using grayscale, it doesn't really matter too much at all. That is a trick I like to use with the accuracy of portraits. If I find that the piece doesn't really change much when you put it to grayscale, I feel like the lightness will be hopefully more apparent. If it does change quite a lot with the grayscale filter, normally that means that I could do with a little bit more work on keeping the lightness as close to both the grayscale and the colour piece. As much as this video looks easy and quick, I can guarantee that this does take a very long time even longer when you're a perfectionist like me. I believe this footage is sped up by 13 times, so I think I had about five hours worth of footage for this piece, so it does take a very long time. Often I question whether it's worth the amount of time that it takes when I have a finished portrait that I'm genuinely really chuffed with. It absolutely is worth it. That being said, I've also done many portraits that have ended up in the rubbish bin. As the materials I use after the Copic markers, they are all pencil crayon. Of those, I tend to use the Caran d'Ache Luminance, Derwent Lightfast, Faber-Castell Polychromo and the Derwent Drawing Pencils. If I want an opaque colour, I tend to go down the route of a drawing pencil by Derwent or a Caran d'Ache Luminance because they have a lot of vibrancy but they do pack a punch in saturation. If I'm looking for a nice blendability, the Derwent Lightfasts do have a lovely grain to them and I find blending to each other beautifully as well as in different formulas as well. I find the Derwent drawing pencils are very versatile to be worked with other pencils as well. The Polychromos are a classic pencil as well, and rightly so, they are brilliant in terms of formulation and blendability. I absolutely love these certain colours of the neutral tones because I find they have quite unique colours. There's a colour called Earth Green, which is very good for portraits. You might not think a green would be good, but it has got a milkiness to it and a coolness that works really well as an undertone. So if I layer colours over the top with that green, I do get a nice cool undertone without it looking very obviously violet or blue. I'm also yet to find a black that's softer and blendable and as opaque as the Polychromo Black. Another tool I do find useful depending on what portraits I do are the blender pencils. I believe these are also from Derwent. You can get a pack of blender and burnishers. I predominantly use the blenders. I'm not really into the burnishing technique, partly because I don't really know what to do with it, but I like the blender pencils because they add a softness to the piece without it being opaque or add a different colour or change the colours for that reason. It is a very transparent effect where it blends the colours only on the page, not adding more colour to it. You can also use the blender, almost cardboard tips that you can use as well, but I do find that the pencils are a little bit harder, so they do blend a little bit more than, say, the cardboard tips that you can get elsewhere. I feel like at this point I've started to see the vision of it coming together and I used a brush pen and normally I would use black but because I felt like the, the darkness was already apparent in this piece I actually went with sepia so it's a similar darkness but it has a brown hint to it without it being too warm and that worked perfectly for the complexion of Pedro Pascal. As I already mapped out the darker areas of the portrait, I didn't want to go darker with the facial hair or the hair because I didn't want that to take away from the depth of his eyes and the hair as well. So the sepia was definitely a, a worthy risk. Once I finished tweaking the areas that I wanted to have in pencil crayon and on the face, it was time to then start working in the final details. And this is normally done with a white gel pen. I personally prefer the Signo White by Uni. I do have the creamy white version because I find the opacity is just that little bit stronger. And when doing portraits, I do need more of a opaqueness. I find sometimes the white can be a little bit transparent and on darker complexions or dark hair, I do want it to contrast a little bit better. So the cream white is normally the one that I go for. Highlights are probably the most satisfying bit of a portrait. 
I feel like the efforts of blending loads of pencil crayon is rewarded by the satisfying precision of highlights. I normally start on hair and facial hair because that's normally the bit that requires the most. And I do sometimes find changing direction, especially on facial hair, gives it that more roughness and organic appearance. Whereas if they were all precisely put in the same direction, it looks a bit too well groomed. And normally when men have more visible facial hair, it is often a more rugged appearance. It's details like that can turn a good portrait into a great portrait. It kind of nods at the behind the scenes or the preparation for this photo to be taken. Did they want it perfect so the hair is put in a well thought out style and lots of effort has been made? Or is there a bit more of a sort of effortlessness, almost like they just got out of bed and looked this good? I find if you can capture the storytelling behind a portrait, it definitely gives more of an interest in the viewing. Now, I don't know if this is just my tattoo artist past, but I often do the eyes last. In tattoos, it's seen as bad luck if you do the eyes before anything else. And that's always stayed with me as a bit of a rule whenever I do portraits. I don't know why, it could just be because of the past, but I definitely can't seem to shake the habit. But that, my loves, is the finished process of me drawing Pedro Pascal, and I'm really pleased with it. I've also really been enjoying The Mandalorian, hence the inspiration behind this portrait. I'm really happy to have picked up portraiture again and I'm hoping to do more of it so if that sounds like something that tickles your fancy do stay tuned. Thank you so so much for joining me and watching this video. If you like this video or like me please do subscribe to my channel. I would love to have you here and join me on all of my arty endeavours. If this is your first video of mine I also make polymer clay jewellery and I sell it on my Etsy so that's also linked below along with digital art and stickers and hopefully some crochet soon. But I've rambled on long enough. I'll let you go. Thank you so much for watching. Have a truly magical rest of your day. Please stay safe out there and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!